Welcome to the COP TV, the voice of football's most famous stand. Yes, hello and welcome back to Top of the Cops, your weekly instrument number 24, almost half a year now of Top of the Cops. You can thank me later. Uh, today I have got an absolute belter of a show with a man who I've met on the footballing scene. He's a top bloke, uh, really into his fashion, his sport, his music, and uh, obviously he's Chelsea as well. Rory Jennings, how are we? Good, sir. Yeah, I'm very well, mate. Thank you for having us on. I've just realised that I'm wearing the exact same top. That you've used in the thumbnail, just to confirm. I do have other oh, clothes. Really? It's just, yeah, it's just a coincidence, but I do have other clothes as well. It's just <laughs> I can to... actually vouch that you have other clothes because I was with you pretty much. Uh, well, clothes yeah. shopping the other day, wasn't You're I? Right. So, uh, absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. This is actually your second appearance on uh, the Cop TV. The first one was a very um, a fleeting visit. Uh, but this one is obviously a lot more thought behind it, and uh, and we we thank you for coming on. Please, guys, do get your questions in here in the comments for Rory Jennings. We'll be answering them as we proceed through the episode. Uh, and also, what we have to remember as well, Chelsea actually kick off in about nine minutes against Wren uh, in the Champions League. So a big, a massive, even extended thank you to Rory for jumping on whilst Chelsea are playing. I've got it in my eye line. Well, exactly. You can see it. So you're not missing anything. Great stuff. So let's get into a little bit of a football roundup. Then I know you've um, recently just launched your YouTube channel, Rory. It's absolutely flying out the doors. And you kind of do a Rory reacts, don't you? Where you kind of uh, react to every game that's happened. Yeah, I mean, I've, watched, I've watched your video, um, you know, reacting to Liverpool's emphatic win against Leicester 3-0. I mean, it was quite something, Rory, wasn't it? It's a great win. It's a huge result, actually. Yeah, it's a um, it's a very very impressive result because I think that when other people were looking at the fixture list, anybody that has aspirations of winning the title was looking at that one and thinking just maybe there's something there. Maybe Rogers going back to Liverpool. Maybe there's a way that Liverpool drop points that day. So to answer those questions so so emphatically is rather depressing. Yeah, as a Chelsea fan, obviously you weren't keen to see that. Ben Stokes, of all people. I don't think it's the actual Ben Stokes. But he says, big up Rory. Uh, Danny Fredodon, big up Rory as well. Diego is in the house as well. Big up to you, sir. Uh, yeah, big win for Liverpool. I think um, that it's made it 64 games now unbeaten at Anfield. The current record, of course, is 84 by Chelsea, which ended, funnily enough, uh, against us uh, back in 2008 at the Bridge. I mean, 20 oh, games what, was, it, what, was it Liverpool that ended that reign? It was, mate. Do you remember? I um, it was Sunderland. Was it? No, it was the deflected Shabby Alonso goal in 2008, 08-09. Uh, oh, yeah. One nil we won, yeah, which ended the uh, the incredible run oh, that it was. I we probably, probably another season um, in terms of home games for Liverpool to go to actually compete with that. But 86 games, first of all, what a record. But second, Rory, can this Liverpool team eclipse it? Oh, do you know what? It's so hard. And I think I think they probably can't. I think ultimately the reason that that record has stood for such a long time is because it's so hard to break. You may do it. And if you do, I would then say that it would never be broken because I think it's such an achievement. Um, but I think law of averages would suggest that ultimately, in this, particularly in a campaign like this, you know where the games are coming so thick and fast. I would suggest that you may lose a game before that record is reached. But if anyone can do it, it is this Liverpool side because they are incredible. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with that. Jota also becoming the first Liverpool player to score in his first four appearances at Anfield, all with no fans. Um, but when, when Salah comes back, which we actually think he'll start uh, tomorrow against Atalanta in the Champions League, but then we play Brighton early kickoff on Saturday, Rory. With Salah back now in contention to start, and obviously Firmino scoring the other night, Mane playing well as always, Jota scoring. What is our starting attack in your eyes, from a Chelsea perspective, our best uh, starting attackers? I think people are, people have very short memories for me. And I appreciate how well Jota has done. He's looked incredible, scored goals, hit the ground running. A testament to the recruitment policy at Anfield, the fact that you sign so many players who just come in slotting hit the ground running. 
But people seem to forget that the front three of Firmino flanked either side by Mane mm. and Salah has been so good for so long and seen so much success and brought in so much silverware. People seem to have very short memories. And they start talk, talking about dropping Firmino and, and replace, or potentially replacing Salah or, or whatever way you look to do it. For me, there's no debate. The front three is a front three that's carried you to a title in a European Cup. Yeah, um, I mean, there is obviously an argument to say if you look at form, the last 10, 15 games, Jota absolutely uh, shadows, um, you know, Firmino's numbers, especially goals. Um, but is there is there space to have all four? I mean, you would lose someone in midfield, obviously, but that was Klopp has experimented with Firmino maybe just sitting in a tiny bit with Jota further up. I think it's quite... A, well, look, as problems go, it's a good problem to have. But when you think about the issues that Liverpool have, in theory at least. The vulnerability of Liverpool is the defence, right? That's where it should be weak. Therefore, you need to play the game not in your final third. The game needs to be played mm. in the opposition's final third. So having more attacking-minded players on the pitch could ultimately do you a favour. So potentially sacrificing one of the midfielders who have carried you so well for somebody like Jota, who has more an eye on a goal than somebody who thinks backwards could be a good uh, could be a good move because the best form of defense is attack and if you're worried about your defense playing the game as far away from them as possible is a good thing and Jota will help you do that yeah I think Jota well 40 year old Virgil here says Jota over Werner of course we were in big time for Werner in the summer uh, all the way throughout and then Chelsea picked him up at the last minute do you think I mean who would you be happier with at the minute you've obviously got Werner we've got Jota Difficult from from a Chelsea and Liverpool perspective, but I know you've, you're more than capable of putting your neutral cap on as well. I, I mean, mean, who's got the better deal so far? Werner's been Werner's been incredible. I mean, on on the episode of the kickoff that I did the other day, a, a debate came up about Werner, and it was very harsh on him. His form, not everybody, by the way, that wasn't unanimous around the table, but certain people were suggesting that he. I mean, there were some very negative words used about him. I can't. I mean, look, I watch Chelsea play every every game he has been ma he has been magnificent he really has uh as a striker you could make a case that he misses too many chances but i would say that all good strikers miss chances you, you go back over history andy cole would miss chances salah can be fairly mm. wasteful yeah but you wouldn't change him would you no of course not and that's how i feel about timo Werner. there's no doubt in my mind that timo Werner scores bundles of goals for chelsea and crucially like he did on the weekend against newcastle creates them as well well, the interesting thing, you mentioned Salah there. In his first season, which still stands to be his most prolific for Liverpool, 44 goals in all comps. But if you go back to that season, genuinely, this is no word of a lie, he could have easily had 60 goals that season, maybe even more. He hit the post a lot. He was quite wasteful in front of goal. He maybe needed three chances to score one. And it's unbelievable when you think about it. And I actually agree with you. I think Werner, of course, he has missed a few chances, played a few dodgy passes across goal, what have you. But he is still banging in the goals. And I think his accumulation over the season will probably be maybe reflecting on how many shots he does take. Uh, and let's see if he can become more clinical. But I do think he'll, in the long term, work out for Chelsea. I can't lie. Um, everyone's saying that here, well, like Ben Stokes says, Werner, because in my opinion, he has a higher ceiling, but doesn't change my opinion on Jota quality player um yeah i mean go pal getting in touch here deny as much as you can chelsea 03 to 06 side with the typical jose side look good for stats but nothing for a neutral to admire about do you agree with that no not really i think again <laughs> history is being very unkind to that chelsea team people like to tarnish Mourinho. look i, I have no love for Mourinho whatsoever if anything i dislike him an awful lot but he, the 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 rumour that seems to be around him is that his team's play boring football and that he's not quite the entertainer and that it's it's rugged, pragmatic football and boring. It couldn't be further from the truth. Some of the best football I've ever seen was played under Mourinho with Drogba, Robin and Duff linking up. Mm. That was an electric team. It was effervescent, constantly on the move. To say that Mourinho only plays one way and it's boring, I, I disagree with that. No, I'd, I'd agree with you there, to be fair, Rory. I think there were 
glimpses, well, a lot of glimpses, to be fair, of that that three up front working. And it maybe even has a, a big reason as why people do play 4-3-3 these days. Speaking of Jose Mourinho, big result for Spurs, 2-0 against Man City, uh, currently top on goal difference. I mean, you must have spoken about this already, Rory, but does this now make them a bit more legitimate title contenders than before? Uh, no, look, I, I feel that Chelsea were title contenders from day one. I, I genuinely put Chelsea I'm to win the league. About Spurs. Oh, Tottenham, no, of course it doesn't. No, <laughs> no. no, sorry, mate. No, top, no, absolutely not. I'm not prepared to listen to Tottenham winning the league conversation again. Every year we seem to hear the same thing. Every year, it's, every year Tottenham are the best team. Every year... If the season went from January to December, Tottenham are the best team. Tottenham have been the best team over the past two years. Harry Kane is the best striker in the league. Deli Ali is the best midfielder in the league. Christian Eriksen was the most creative. I'm, I'm bored of it, to be honest. And until Tottenham win a trophy, until Tottenham prove that they're not Tottenham, they'll always be Tottenham for me. Brilliantly rounded off. Uh, let's touch on the good result here for Chelsea as well. Another clean sheet for Mendy. The defence, I have to say... After a very shaky start, I would say they're actually probably the most informed defence right now. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think we've conceded one in five. Um, we're, we're looking, yeah, and and, in, and that one, by the way, was a game we won 4-1. Uh, we're looking very good. Since Edouard Mendy came in, he has totally revolutionised the back line. Thiago Silva is silk, like pure silk. It's a good back line now. You know, Kurt Zuma looks very accomplished alongside, you know, he can still be a bit it, it rash, we'll say. But mm. alongside Thiago Silva, he looks good. Ben Chilwell has been a revelation. I had no idea he was quite this good, but he's, he has been. And um, on the other side, Rhys James has been solid, really solid. So I think that our back line is sorted out now. The problem is Thiago Silva can't play all the time. Like Thiago Silva didn't even go to Newcastle. He didn't travel. Mm. And we don't really have the replacements. Rudiger's terrible. Christensen's terrible. We don't have any replacements. But if we can keep that back line fit, we're OK. Yeah, let's quickly go through some other big stories then to come out uh, stats-wise about the Premier League. Apparently, there has never in the history of the top flights for football uh, been a season with more home wins than away wins. Currently, there have been... Sorry, there's never been a season where there's been more away wins than home wins. Currently... 32 home wins, 38 away wins. The tide has completely kind of shifted there. A big stat to come out. I mean, that it, it must have been a lot of it come down to that there's no fans in the stadium. But speaking about that, Rory, there obviously was some news about uh, some fans being let in the stadium with tier two cities up to having uh, up to 4,000. Do you think this is going to actually last? Do you think this is a stepping stone for all of us back or is it? Maybe a golden carrot that then gets dragged away. No, they have to get fans back in the stadium. I'm so sick of all this. Like if if London goes into tier three, I'm gonna cry. Um, we we have to get fans back in the stadium. It's essential. It's actually like ruining the product. I think it's. I, I don't think we'll never be able to categorise this. I'm sure people will disagree with me, but I think it's having a, an impact negatively on the results. Okay, maybe for entertainment yeah. value, it's good. But Liverpool shouldn't be conceding seven at Aston Villa. I'm not mm. having that if there's 3,000 scousers in the away end at Villa Park, that happens. I'm not having that Man United concede six to Tottenham at Old Trafford if there's mm. 80,000 fans in that stadium. And I think it's an essential thing. I think Oliver Dowden and whoever's making these policies up as they go along need to prioritise fans back in the ground. This 4,000 across the board doesn't make much sense to me, by the way, because if you do 4,000 at Stamford Bridge, and then you do 4,000 at St. James's Park. How's that the same? In mm. You know what I mean? In terms of, so, like, how is it not a percentage of the stadium? So I can't quite understand that. But whatever the answer is, get fans back in the stadium now. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a bit of a sensationalist headline, as it normally is from, well, most newspapers, to be honest. But the Daily Mail said fans allowed back in stadiums. And then, obviously, it was the caveat about what tier you're in. Uh, and how many you're allowed back. I think, yeah, you're completely right. 4,000 in Barnet Stadium, which probably fills it halfway, is not obviously the same as 4,000 in St. James's Park. Yeah, or something exactly. Like that. So exactly. It's just completely un, 
jointed it's completely made up it just seems like again there's no real strategy here nuclear atom says wow you actually got rory in your stream yes i did he's sitting right there i always watch him on triple eight sports videos and the kickoff streams love that um i actually watched your triple eight sport the latest one i came out today today. bro i was laughing because you've got x going and right back you've got reese james lil dirk blah 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 blah, and then you just go He's in the team, isn't he? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's great expressions. I do like working with him. Funnily enough, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing something with him tomorrow. But he was on a, we did a We did a record for it today, so there'll be more uh, 888 videos out soon. Yeah, they're good. I enjoy doing them. I think they're brilliant. Yeah, I actually did a triple eight sport with yourself, Annex, before. That's right, yeah. And, um, yeah, he is something, isn't he? You've got to love him, absolutely. Yeah. Diego agreeing that football needs the fans back in the stadiums. Right, let's get on to my favourite part of the show, ladies and gents. Of course, it's the match day mixer section of the show. So if you're new to this channel, you might not know what the match day mixer is. But essentially, I round up the five main and best components of going to the match. Uh, that's food, that's drink, that's music, it's, it's, it's clothes and it's trainers as well. So before the show, I asked Rory, what is his match day mixer? And here's what he's come back with. Some very, very interesting choices here, guys, as well. And some some choices that we've never actually seen before on top of the cop. So we're going to start off with the jacket, as we always do. This one's an absolute beauty. Rory actually put up uh, a picture. I think you were away in Anderlecht 15 years ago, was it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stone Island that night, but tonight you've gone for a CP Company jacket. I mean, producer Tom has literally typed in CP Company jacket, and I'm pretty much guessing this is the first picture that you've seen. Um, yeah. Talk to me about your selection then. You obviously know your jackets, man. You're a big jacket man. You, know, get the, you get the quality of the Stone Island, but without the... I'm, I'm far too old to be... Like, I, was wearing, I was wearing a metallic gold Stone <laughs> Island coat at an away game in Europe. I can't do that anymore. I've got a kid. I've got a kid, and uh, oh, you know, times have, times have moved on. So I've gone for the quality, but a slightly more sober version. Yeah, CP Company and Stone Island—a big uh, history together. They were both started by the same person, then it kind of separated. Um, big fan of CP. Make great jackets. Uh, and Rory has gone for them this evening. Obviously, you've got to be warm getting down to Stamford Bridge. To be fair, the last time uh, I was at an away game was Stamford Bridge, Chelsea in the FA Cup. That night, I was wearing a Stone Island shirt, and I got absolute fucking dogs abuse that night outside Stamford Bridge. Because when I come out to set up my fan cams, um, the police have kind of switched the diversion. So all of a sudden, I'm standing there with a mic like this, and you've got about 400 Chelsea fans walking <laughs> towards me i've got a big red mic that says the cop tv fucking hide that <laughs> <laughs> yeah not ideal mate not what you need not ideal not where you want to be Chelsea caught. win. <laughs> exactly yeah two nil on the night let's talk about trainers um you've gone for an absolute pair of classics literally uh reebok classics you could have gone the the other you know lane that other people have gone on the top of the cops your deals your your adidas's your valenciagas your, even your Balenciaga, yeah, your, your, your Lamb Vans, we've had some people as well. But Reebok Classics, Rory, talk to me. Well, it's just a, it's a staple, isn't it? You, yeah. can't, you can't get better than that. It's, uh, it does exactly what it says on the tin. And I think, although I'm from North London, I think there's a, like the biggest club in South London is Chelsea. Chelsea aren't a South London club. Chelsea are a West London club. But, and then, you know, they're north of the river. But the biggest club support-wise in South London is Chelsea. Uh, more more South Londoners would follow Chelsea than anyone else. Like the nearest club to all those areas, Brixton and whoever, wherever else, is Chelsea. And I think the Reebok Classic has very much become the trainer of the South Londoner. And as a result, that influence has remained at Stamford Bridge. And I think it's uh, infected me. I'm a convert. Yeah. Yeah, I'm North London boy myself. And uh, yeah, you're right. You do see these, to be fair, a little bit more in South London. Um, no, big shoe. These are the type of shoes, bro, that you could see painters wearing for 20 years on end. You know, I've seen painted decorators yeah. wear these. <laughs> but they paint them. They paint them white when they go Pretty a bit. Much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, got that paint on deck. Um, Expressions is a funny guy, says Morbid. Let's get into your other match day mixer. Now, this is where, again... Um, you know, it becomes a little bit, uh, question marks do appear because normally, Rory, and this isn't your fault at all, 
But normally, I have the type of people on that won't be seen dead with one of these bad boys before the game. It is, of course, a glass of red wine. A lot of the people, they like pints. They like, you know, beers. They like cider. They like, especially before the game. Talk to me about the red wine. Well, ideally, before a match, if it all goes, if, if everything goes to plan, I'll go out for dinner before a game. Before you know, the go game, out for, right. go out for, I'll go out for a nice meal before the game. Yeah, depending on what time time the game is. But if it's a three o'clock game, I'll easily go for lunch first. And if it's uh, an equally a five o'clock, or, or you can, you know, I'll always make, I'll always revolve it around a nice meal in a nice restaurant. So an away game, I'll, a, a big pleasure that I get for going to away games is what restaurant we're going to go to. So when it's Liverpool, we always go to that San Carlo before the game. Um, in Manchester, there's a fair few that are that's worth going to. There at San Carlo, yeah, very nice. In, that's the that's the Liverpool one always. Um, Manchester will always be there's a there's one called Tattoo, which is like Pan Asian thing, which is very nice. Um, so it's always uh, it's always high on the priority list to sort out a restaurant before the game. Nothing nicer than having a nice meal accompanied by a bottle of red. So uh, yeah, if there's a if there's a bottle of Barolo on the go, I'm also very happy. There you go, a wine man. Rory, you obviously know your stuff. Me, I'm a, I'm a lager man or a bit of spice rum if I'm feeling a bit, uh, a bit, a bit generous. Well, I've had a couple of spice rums out here, to be fair, and they've gone down a little treat, to be fair. <laughs> oh, are you Pop- still away? I'm still here, mate. Still out here. You've yeah. emigrated. <laughs> Pretty much, man. We haven't, <laughs> still haven't booked a return flight, but um, looking to come home probably, probably after the Wolves game on the, on the sick. Um, no, but yeah, San Carlo and Liverpool, big shout there. Um, I think Rory is definitely a person who, obviously, you know, he could easily add a pie outside the ground. He easily could have had a hot dog. But obviously, he likes his finer things, the San Carlos, the red wines. It all screams, uh, you know, the finer things in life. But here's one thing that there was absolutely no doubt about. And this is a a very um, popular pick with guests on the show. This is, of course, the music that you listen to on the match day. You've claimed Oasis... I mean, again, you know me, bro. I'm a huge fan of Oasis, so I will never, you know, contest anyone who picks these lads. Yeah, I mean, uh, Oasis are, they're certainly my generation's best band. I mean, for the, depending on depending on your mood, I don't think there's me a better... Me too as well, man. Yeah, I don't think there's a better band. I think you could make a... I would make a nice honourable mention for the Arctic Monkeys as well. But that's certainly... Always, it's always a winner. It's a very safe bet. It's like uh, it's like going on a stag do to Holland. You're always going to have a good time. It's safe, safe pair of hands. It's Edward Mendy. Um, but then I'd always throw in a bit of uh, again, just generationally. It's always going to be garage. If you're if you're my age and from London, garage is always going to have a soft spot uh, in your life. So I'd always I'd always bring a bit of that up as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're you're a couple with all respect. You're a couple of years um, older than me, but I actually feel like I caught the end of that. So like I remember when I was a kid, growing up and seeing So Solid and Miss Dynamite and and these guys on TV, kind of flying the flag for mainstream garage. And then even at that stage, Oasis was still a thing. So I was picking up new singles that were coming out even as a kid. But I think the beautiful thing about going to a Liam or a Noel gig now is that you've got guys there who are in their sixties who are maybe. 30 when Oasis came out and then you've got the lads who are 40 and they were 20 when Oasis came yeah, out. Yeah, everyone claims them, don't they? Everybody but now, bro, yeah. you've got 15, 16 year olds at Liam Gallagher gigs. I was at one last summer. You've got these young guys at Knowles because good music always lasts, right? It doesn't matter what generation you are. I still listen to Frank Sinatra. I still listen to Sting. Even go before that, Matt Monroe. I still listen to these guys because music is is ever less and, and if it's good, it always lasts, and that's and that's what you get with a, a songwriter like Noel. If you were to choose to see Liam or Noel in concert, Rory, who would it be? Liam, I think. I like the yeah. I like the swagger. I like the I like a front man. I like Dang. a front man. I like the attitude. Um, I also think, at the time at least, the voice was the voice was unrivaled. So oh, yeah. I do love. Uh, I don't I mean I love them both, but. For me, it will always. I've seen them both individually, and I think the show that Liam puts on is a little bit more raucous and aggressive, and I like, and I enjoy that. I'd actually agree. I'd say raucous and aggressive for Liam. I'd say more emotional uh, for Noel, just because he does bring out the Wonder Walls and the Don't Look Back in Angers right towards the end, which obviously is a bit 
a bit of an emotional one. But yeah, great choice. There you go. The Rory's Match Day Mixer, a CP Company jacket, Reebok Classics, Oasis, Red Wine, with a bit of San Carlos there thrown in as well. Uh, let's get into your classic Would You Rather questions then, Rory. Uh, choose your partnership. Please do get involved in the comments for this as well. Liverpool and Chelsea fans, please. So you have to pick one out of the three pairs. You can't mix and match. The sets are set. You have okay. Drogba and Torres. Hasselbank, Jimmy Floyd, and uh, Luis Suarez. And then you have Costa and Salah. We're going with a 4 4 2 formation, a classic would you rather. Rory, who's your choice and why? The winners here are Hasselbank and Suarez. And that's Hassel what I went for as well. Love Hasselbank that. and Suarez are undoubtedly the winner. I mean, Drogba, Drogba and Torres. Costa, Salah, excellent. Excellent players. I, you know, I love Diego Costa. Salah at Chelsea just didn't happen, but obviously he proved that to be an error on Chelsea's behalf. But I haven't seen a better single season from any player. You know, just if you look at one particular season yeah. in, in its own right, no context, one, one season, one player. I haven't seen anything like what Luis Suarez did for Liverpool the year that they didn't win the league. Mm. Um, it was an, I, I think as well, to... to Add to how amazing he was. He won the Golden Boot. He also yeah. was banned because for I think he, fit Ivan, yeah, he was banned for the first however many games and still won the Golden Boot. I think, mm. he missed, I think he missed a lot of games. I think he missed like eight games and still won the Golden Boot. I've never seen a season like that from an individual player. I thought, I thought Suarez, I know, I know that there's reasons to dislike Suarez, but I loved him. I thought he was brilliant. I just thought he was absolutely brilliant. And Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank is a very underrated Striker, he, he was brilliant. He was a brilliant player. Also, they, those two played in Holland, so presumably they could both speak Dutch and uh, and, and baffle defenders. So there's another layer where they they don't went one another. But that's the winning yeah. partnership there. I'm there is no doubt about it. I when we were having this uh, chat in the pre-production meeting, they all said, "Oh, it's got to be Drogba and Torres." And then the other person said, "No, it's got to be Costa and Salah." And I said, "Lads, you're both wrong." It's Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank and Luis Suarez. You're in that season you're talking about, I think it was third, played 29 games, scored 31 goals uh, for Salah. But then also, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank is part of the Premier League 100 club. He himself scored 30 goals in a season once, I think, as well. Nuclear Atoms here says, I don't know who is Jimmy Floyd. I'm 18 years old and I started watching club football since 14. Can you tell me how good he was, Rory? Yeah, I can. He was amazing. Chelsea signed him from Leeds. Leeds United fans hate him. They they assume, they they uh well he didn't we didn't sign him direct. He went to Atletico Madrid as well, I think. That's but true. he um Leeds fans will always call him Jimmy Floyd piggy bank because they think he's uh. gonna move for money. But he was an amazing striker. He's also very unlucky at Chelsea because he played for us in an era. He was surrounded by trophies, but he played for us and uh didn't win anything. He was just very unfortunate when it when his career landed. But the partnership that he had up front with Ida Johnson was one of the best partnerships that Chelsea have seen. They really did complement each other, other well. It wasn't far off York and Cole. They were they were magnificent together. And they used to speak Dutch, actually. Ida Johnson yeah. and Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank used to speak in Dutch to one another. Um, just a lethal, a lethal finisher. Such a good shot. Scored a perfect hat trick against Tottenham. So for will ever, so forever will have my heart. Scored. Look up his hat trick against Tottenham, and you'll see what kind of player he is. Left foot, right foot header, brilliant. It was, just, it was in an era. I'm just going to get this in. It was in. An, it was in a period when he scored that goal. Those goals against Tottenham. We beat Tottenham four 0 twice in three days. The glory days. <laughs> what was that? Two thousand one. Yeah, kind of right. we beat them in the cup four 0 and then three days later we beat them in the league four 0 and Hasselbank scored that hat trick. Do you know what? I remember his goal at Old Trafford. That yeah, was a he, fucking belter. He took it on his chest and then belted yeah. it into the opposite corner. Yeah, yeah, that was a belter. But then I also remember 2-2 two, two at Anfield, the year 2000, Liverpool two with Chelsea. Owen scored two and Hasselbank scored two. Kind of cancelled each other out. Yeah, I remember. I mean, he, just, he, was just a, he was just a bit unfortunate because at international level, he never really got the chance because it was at the time when, you know, it's Burkham oh, and you know, Cliver and whoever else playing. Um, so he, he never really got the chance at international level, but he was a, he was a brilliant player and very underrated because he's through no fault of his own. His trophy hall isn't especially impressive. 
but he was a, he was a magnificent striker. Yeah, I have to give it to you there. Rory Choice, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank and Luis Suarez. Got time for another Would You Rather Now? Choose your central midfield partnership. Now, this one is an absolute belter. You've got Frank Lampard and Xabi Alonso as one partnership. Then Stevie G and Claude Makalele as another. But then as a wild card, you've got N'Golo Conte with Thiago Alcantara there as well so guys in the comments let us know what you're going for uh morbid angel here reminds us that suarez missed eight games that season so only played 30 scored 31 unbelievable morbid then says torres and Drogba wouldn't work they're both better up top in their own that's why Hasselbank and suarez got it but rory big decision here mate huge call what are we going for well i think the problem here is the one i would naturally give it to because i i love both of them as footballers would be Lampard and, and Alonso. But I don't think they can work together. They don't get on. Lampard mm, broke Alonso's foot. Yeah. Lampard yeah. broke Alonso's foot. And therefore, you can't play them together. They hate each other. Although it did work for Sheringham and Andy Cole. They used to hate each other and played together fine. So maybe it could work. Um, the one I'm going to discount immediately is Kante and Alcantara. Wow. I know Alcantara is a good player, but he's played 20 minutes of Premier League football. He doesn't get... So, the, so he doesn't... He's not in this conversation. It'd be so out of order to give it to Alcantara when you've got Alonso, Lampard, Gerard, McElhaney, all competing for it. So Kante's partnership's out, which means we debate the other two. I think the balance, if, if, if Alonso and Lampard could put their beef aside, then you, then you are looking at serious partnership. They have everything actually. Tackles, good in the tackle, brilliant at assisting, loads of goals, See, with with Gerard and Makaleli, as good as Makaleli was, you're not getting any you're not getting anything out of him in an offensive way. So it's is that why you would burden. maybe choose that that couple though? Because you've got Gerard who can run, and you've got Makaleli. Football's the moved on from really. that though. I think yeah. football's moved on. You, you you no longer have the destroyer and the creator. You no longer mm. have Ince and Gaza. You now have Frank Lampard, who will win as many tackles uh, as as anyone that can defend, but score as many goals as anyone that can go forward. The, the modern day midfielder needs to be able to do it all. It's actually a problem that Chelsea had last season. It's kind of not such an issue this year. But our midfielders, as good as they were, people will tell you that Jorginho's great. I would disagree, but people will tell you Jorginho's great. Mateo Kovacic is great. And then Golo Kante is great. Kante is great. The other two are good. Well, Kovacic is good. Jorginho, not really for me. But those three combined will probably get 10 goals, if you're lucky. Mm. The days when we were good, you have... Balak, Essien, Lampard, they score 60. And that's what wins your games. So for me, the partnership here, but you'd have to have a word with them. I'd have to interview them and make sure they're happy to work together. <laughs> it would be Frank Lampard and Xabi Alonso. There you go then. Rory going for Frankie Lamps, uh, the current Chelsea manager, of course, and Xabi Alonso. I actually remember the game you're talking about where Lampard injured Alonso. Didn't it leave him out of, uh, was it the return Champions League semi? can't remember, but Alonso was either booked for it or got injured. But I, yeah, I, I do remember that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they, they're, not, uh, they're not friends, are they? No, definitely don't get on, to be fair. Michael is Gerard and Makalele. That's, for me, um, the most balanced there. But then again, what Rory says about how the game has changed is definitely a good shout. However, I think, uh, yeah. He said, I could easily be persuaded to pick Lampard and Alonso, to be fair. Alonso, one of my favourite players of all time, to be honest. So, it's a tough one, really. Callum hudson Adoy has just scored, by the way. Chelsea won up against Wren uh, in the Champions League. 22 minutes in uh, and Callum hudson Adoy scores. I mean, it, this is actually a fairly big one for Chelsea tonight in Group E. If they win this, I mean, they go a lot closer to, to qualifying, surely. Yeah, we have, we've got a very good group, Alex. We've been we've been very fortunate because Krasnodar, who are only ever there to make up the numbers, no disrespect yeah. to them, but that's a fact. And then we got Wren. You know when the pot that can be a bit tricky. Mm. We got Wren, and Wren shouldn't even be in the competition. Yeah, like like you know what happened? They, they do you know how it worked out for them? They they the got the, the, the points per average or something like no, that. No, 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 no. The French well, the French league just stopped. It's like playing musical chairs, right? Say the music stops. Doesn't matter how many games you play. Doesn't matter about anything. If the music stops and you're in the seat, yeah. you win. 
and the music stops in the French League and Rennes happen to be in the Champions League spots. So they got it. But they shouldn't have, like, Lyon were going to catch them. Like, a few teams were going to catch them, but the music stopped, bang. Rennes was sitting in the in the top three and they were like, oh, hold tight. We're in the Champions League. And it was simple as that. It was a ridiculous way to do it. So ultimately, we're playing a team who shouldn't be in the competition and we nick their goalie. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that. Mendy playing against his old team already so soon in his career. Sevilla also 1-0 up. It does look like it's going to be a battle between you and Sevilla for that top spot. Realistically, how far can Chelsea go in this Champions League? Big game tonight. Uh, well, the thing with any, the thing with the Champions League is anyone can go anywhere. There's no yeah. look, look. There's no reason why we, we're through in the group. The, the group has already shaped up. It's going to be Chelsea and Seville competing for the top spots, and Krasnodar Ren competing for the Europa League. So we're through. If we if we finish top of the group and we have a kind draw. You never, you know, you never know. I, I have ambitions to win the tournament, but as a Chelsea fan over the past two decades, I've been conditioned to have an ambition to win every tournament. So there is no reason why we shouldn't compete for it. I concede we're not favourites. Liverpool, Bayern Munich, I perhaps wrongly, again, through being conditioned, I always think Real Madrid, even though I know they're going through, their, they're having their moments, they're struggling, in fact. But if Real Madrid might turn it round, get through the group, wouldn't especially want to play them in February. Um, but look, Liverpool and Bayern are the teams to beat. And do you know what? At some point, City have to win it, don't they? They just have to. Well, exactly. I think unless they win the Champions League slash Premier League this season, he has to go. I think he has to go anyway. I think he's Absolutely. been a terrible. Yeah, and I think, you know, the hey, two years... I said years that on something yesterday time. and everyone, went, yeah, yeah. everyone had a real pop at me. I said that on, a sh- on something I do yesterday. And uh, like the whole room right, really collapsed in on me. I said, I think Guardiola's flopped it there. Everyone was said, absolutely not. They, they, they were effectively, I don't know them very well either. They were basically saying, who is this guy? Like, what is he talking about? But I Where were you yesterday? Talk sport. All <laughs> oh, right, okay. And, and they said, um, but the, the room I was in, it was like, it was, it was uh, like... The, the Ade people, was there, right? Yeah, Ade was hosting. He wasn't too bad on me, but the two other people in the room were, were like, what are you talking about? I know they've won the league twice, but the performances in Europe have been abysmal. The performances in the league this season is abysmal. And if you compare the team he inherited, the Mancini team, to the team that he built, his team now, mate, he has taken that team down. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, Monaco, Leon. Liverpool, Tottenham, all the teams that have knocked them out of the Champions League in the last four years alone. We'll see how they get on in the Champions League this season. Let's go on to the top of the cops moments of the week. This is the part of the show where I round up the two top of the cops. Oh, no, we actually don't have them in the folder this week, unfortunately. But anyway, the two top of the cops moments were this man getting the Player of the Month award, Diogo Jota, great signing for Liverpool so far, obviously. Uh, and, of course, the other one was uh, Bobby Firmino's goal and, actually, Klopp's push for the scheduling change. I don't know if you saw this video, Rory, but Klopp was being interviewed by Sky Sports. It didn't actually make the cut. But he said to Sky Sports, I don't know who it was asking him the question, but he said, until you speak to BT about you know sorting out the, the scheduling of the, all the broadcasting of the games, we're not going to get anywhere. Players are going to get injured and we might not even finish the season with 11 players because you don't care about the health and wealth of our players. All you care about is who's got which game and when. It's a good point. You can see why it wasn't broadcasted by the networks. And I did have a clip, but it hasn't been uh, installed, but we can still talk about it. I mean, if you're a football fan, you look at that and go, he's got a point. But if you sit on the other side, you're going to have a go at him, aren't you? I think he speaks sense there, really. Um, So what's he saying exactly? So he basically said to Sky, until you speak to BT, nothing will change. When they asked about why Liverpool are getting so many injuries, he said, well, until the broadcasters sort it out, we're not going to get anywhere because there's too many games. You're all fighting for the rights. There's too much money at stake. And essentially, it's driving players. I mean, it's slightly harsh on... I mean, I have... (laughs) It's, it feels slightly harsh on the providers because we're, we're in this situation because of a global pandemic. Do you know, like, 
Like the reason that the season has had to be condensed is because of a pandemic, not because of TV. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Again, it's an anomaly season. They they call it the Christmas period being the busiest. It pretty much is a whole season of congested fixtures, especially the top teams fighting for all the top trophies. Every game um, is about every three days, isn't it? So if you can't keep up, obviously buy some more players. But um, there is one question I wanted to touch on before you went, Rory, and it was a great question that came in earlier. Uh, and it was about what was our favourite Liverpool versus Chelsea kind of uh, head-to-head, let's call them, uh, from the years that have gone by. I'll try and bring up the question now. Um, get thinking, though, Rory, for sure. I've got, and I've got my answer. I'll just get the question up somewhere. But there it goes. Diego, question for Rory and AGT, which has been the most memorable clash between your Chelsea versus Liverpool? Rory, you can go first. So I've got two. One is, one is from when I was a kid. It was the first match I went to with, with my dad. And... Um, it finished 2 all at Stamford Bridge. Steve McManaman scored two for Liverpool and John Spencer scored two for Chelsea. And one of John Spencer's goals, it was a volley. It was just out of this world. He's a tiny fellow, John Spencer. He played for Scotland. <laughs> He's about my height. Honestly, really small. Cross has come in. I think Dan Petrescu clipped it in. And Spencer's just jumped up and volleyed it. Got there before the defender. I think maybe... Uh, Phil Bab, maybe? No, I think... It, do you know? I think it's Mark Wright. Got okay. there before Mark Wright, just, and and volleyed it in. And that, that was huge. So that was my best game ever at Stamford Bridge. One of my best games ever, rather than just my best Liverpool games, just because of the memories. But then my best ever game between us at Anfield, I was up there for the Ivanovic. The Ivanovic. Oh, 3-1. Yeah, well, I was up there for the Kalu one as well. But the Ivanovic one was just incredible. I mean, it, it went wild in that away end. Absolutely wild. So, um so that it, yeah, it's the it's the fiery European affairs that we had through the uh, mid to early two thousands. Yeah, the one you're talking about, I think the home leg at Anfield, three one to Chelsea, and then was yeah, it four, four, four all? Four, four. four all. Yeah. yeah, I mean we've had some unreal games. You had the Brazilian. Your Brazilian left back scored a free kick. Where and the Aurelio, yeah. Aurelio, yeah. He, he pretended to cross it and shot. Yeah. Gave gave check the eyes there, big time. Yeah. The goal, and even in that game, I think we were four four two up. Oh, we were only one know, goal away. There was, there was a time. There, I was at the home game and obviously I'd had a drink that day because I was thinking we're through. This is going to be a non-event. You know, Chelsea are going to win the game 1-0 or something like that or it'll be a one all draw. There was a moment in that ground where I really sobered up because I was thinking, <laughs> oh my God. They're, we, again. they're going to do it. Yeah, we, they're going to do it. And I remember Steve Gerrard actually was asked because at, at the time we played each other in Europe a lot. Hmm. But um, we played each other a lot but you'd never scored at Stanford. You'd knocked us out, but you'd never scored at Stanford Bridge. And obviously now you had to score goals. And a commentator said to Gerard, you know, can you Gerard not Chelsea yet? that game by, basically as well. Was it? Well, Gerard he said to Gerard, can you, can you do it? He said to Gerard, can you do it? Because you've never scored at Stanford Bridge. And, and Gerard's answer was, well, we've never been there with Nando in the team before, talking about Nan- Fernando mm. Torres. But straight away, Torres scored. I was like, oh, God. It's going to happen, but thankfully, the four all Lampard scored a penalty, didn't he? Dedicated it to his mum. Yeah, I remember that one, man. And Alex scored a free kick, didn't he? Yeah, he walloped it. Yeah. Oh, because there was that one, and then and then uh, there was a three two that to to you in 07 08 at, at the bridge in in the league, no, in the Champions League. So the first, so. We played in Europe against each other. Oh four, oh five. There was the nil nil at Stamford Bridge. Yeah, so and then jo- Joe Cole and- scored. Joe Cole scored a one nil. We won- oh no, the nil nil, and then the and then the ghost goal. Yes, and then the season after oh five, oh six. That we was one nil, one nil in the group stage. Yeah, there was nil nil at Anfield. We had each other in the group stage, and I That's think it right. might have been one nil to you at the Bridge, and then we played each other again the next season. Oh six, oh seven. It's is it nil? Is it one nil to you? Yeah, it's one yeah, nil to us. Joe Cole, Joe Cole, Cole slid in. Daniel Wagger, yeah, with, with that early and then goal. Penal- and then penalties again. And then penalties again. Dirk Kout scores the winner, and then that's and then oh seven oh eight is I'm trying to think. Oh, oh that's Ivanovic. Oh eight was Ivanovic. Oh eight oh nine was Ivanovic. Yeah, uh, and I, I can't remember the three two at uh, Stamford Bridge. Three two was when Babel scored from a fucking mile out and Torres scored, but for you, 
uh, Lampard, Pen, Drogba, two. I yes, think. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, Pen. Rangers. And so, I mean, we actually played each other. If you think about it, there every year from two thousand and four to two thousand and nine. Mate, there's a mad stat. Be. There's a mad stat between you know Benitez and Mourinho arrived yeah. at their clubs within a week of each other. Yeah, they played it. I don't know the numbers, but it's mental. I've seen Liverpool played each other in five years fifty times or something. It's something crazy like that. Oh, that's obviously there was a semi final at Old Trafford. There's a semi final at yeah. Old Trafford. There's a final at Cardiff. There's like there's Community all the other final. games as well. Community Shields. There's loads of us. Oh yeah, do you remember the Community Shields? Shevchenko scored. Shev scored. And then Liverpool I... won it. It was Shevchenko's first yeah. game, and he scored. Bellamy and Crouch, I think, scored 2-1 that day. Do you remember uh, there was one at Stanford Bridge as well when Andy Carroll, you knocked us out of a game in... Uh, yes. And Andy Carroll yeah. scored. Yeah. Um, I think Bellamy scored away in a League Cup game. Uh, yeah, I'd say from 2000 and... I'd say four, because then you had the League Cup final, of course, where Gerrard scores the own goal. But from 04 to even like... Because I remember playing you in the FA Cup final 2011. So from 04 all the way up to kind of 2011. 2011 was what? The FA Cup? When FA Cup final. No, you won it. Morelles. No, sorry. Uh, Ramirez. No, 2012. Scored. That's 2012. 2012 was it? Yeah, 2012. Yeah. That's the year we won the European Cup as well. Yeah, good year for you then, to be fair. Yeah, yeah um, Ramirez, yeah. yeah. That kind of eight-year period from 04 to 12, like you said, bro, so many fixtures. And it did really become that kind of um, head-to-head -head battle that everyone looked forward to. It's kind of taken over now with Liverpool and City. Um, but, yeah, some great memories, some great battles. Uh, and this was all during a time, let's not forget, where Chelsea were knocking at the door almost every summer for Steven Gerrard for the signature of him. Yeah, well, well I mean, you won't want to hear this, but he wanted to come, didn't he? Of course he did. His head was turned. He's, a, he's come out and admitted that. But yeah. it's interesting because I think Mourinho and Gerrard have this, this real big respect for each other. Yeah, he um, called him his favourite Mourinho, enemy, didn't he? Favourite enemy. And he said he tried to sign him at Chelsea, Inter and Real Madrid, I think, as well. And, and obviously Gerrard said no every time. So quite nice to see. And I think, listen, with everything said, you have to kind of respect the other team when you have so many head-to-head -head battles and so many... I mean, we had a list together yesterday of all the players that have played for both teams. It's well, unbelievable. That's a, good game. that's a good game. Let's let's go. Let's try and do a bit all of right. tennis, right? So all back right. and forth. All right, I'll go, Carl. I'll give you Victor Moses. Fernando Torres. Nicolas Anelka. Hang on, give me a sec, give me a sec. <laughs> I rate myself at this kind of game as well. Let us know in the comments. Oh, mate. I rate myself at this kind of game. There's a lot, bro. There's a lot. I Is there? There's a lot. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Go on. Have you, got, have you got another one? I'll go with Raul Morelos. Oh, of course. I loved him. I'll go with Yossi Ben Ayoun. Oh, Ben Ayoun, man. Yeah, yeah. It's all the same era as well. Yeah. Um, who else? Salah. Oh, of course, Salah. Anyone back in... Salah? Oh, in sure. the 90s, there wasn't that many that, that made the switch between them. Did do, you know what, do you know what I think my skill is? You know, if you say to me, two clubs, two, any random two clubs, Premier League era, really, yeah. like, don't, don't give me a Rochdale. But yeah. I, reckon, I reckon if someone said, picked out like, two clubs, I can think of a player that's played for both. It's like my party yeah, trip. Let me get you on then. Right. I'm blatantly going to flop now, aren't I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Put me a team together where a player... Put me a name together where the player has played for both Arsenal and Chelsea. Uh, Arsenal, Chelsea. There's a, Arsenal, Chelsea. There really is a lot. Like Arsenal, so Ashley Cole, David Rowcastle, Ars, Arsenal and Chelsea. There's there's a few. All right, let me make it a bit more difficult then. Tottenham, Chelsea. Oh, scummy! These are the Judas. These are the Iscariots. Um, I mean, Gus Poye is the famous one, but Gordon Jury did it. Ida Good Johnson, Carlo Cudicini. Oh, wow, Good Johnson as well. Yeah, Cudicini. Gallas? Gallas did. Well, Gallas played for everyone. He went to Arsenal yeah, as well, he didn't did, he? Did. Here's one, though. Bolo Zenden. That is a great shout. Zenden went to Liverpool, Asia. didn't he? Yeah. Bolo Zenden. And here's an even better shout. Glenn Johnson. Of course. There's a lot. Played for both. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, and I'm sure there's more as well. There must be. Good game. 
I'm trying to think now. Goalkeepers, managers, Rafa Benitez. The Rafa Benitez. Um, was Steve Clark involved at Liverpool? Steve Clark was under. Yeah, he was involved, wasn't he? Yeah, under yeah. Kenny. Yeah, he came in yeah. under Kenny. And obviously, he's a Chelsea thing. Chelsea, yeah, yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable. Jimmy Greaves. Um, I'm not sure about that one. To be fair, Jimmy like, Greaves, Chelsea and Tottenham. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Chelsea and Tottenham. Fantastic. Rory, tell us what you've got coming up. I mean, obviously, we mentioned at the top of the show, you've got your YouTube channel up now, which you can subscribe to in the bio. So please do that. Not just Chelsea. You cover all the clubs. Uh, you're continuing with the kickoff, everything like that. Yeah, all going well. Kickoff's, kickoff's great. Um, really enjoying that. Equally uh, enjoy doing the talk sports show that I do. And I've got my own channel now. Yeah, which is, it's been going about a month. So really enjoying it. There'll be a review up of all the Champions League games tonight. So looking forward to doing that. But yeah, it's great. Come come over and say hello. Absolutely. Go and subscribe to Rosa in the description, please. That wraps up then episode 24 of Top of the Cops. It's been an absolute pleasure to hold it down tonight with Rory. We've got into a lot of good debates. Please watch it back if you can. Like, comment, and of course, most importantly, subscribe if you haven't already. Rory, 